Okay, I think we should start. Um, welcome everybody um, to this um, online workshop uh, with the nice title using the statistical language R as a geographic information system or short GIS. Um, yeah, just one short note beforehand. Uh, you, I think you just heard it that this um, workshop will be recorded. Um, so we will talk about this in a minute. You are allowed to, to ask questions all the time or post them in the chat, but just be aware when, when you um, ask the question by your actual voice or um, also by um, turning on your camera, this will be recorded. So if you're not, um, don't agree with this um, recording of the workshop, um, yeah, maybe just use the other, other ways of posting any questions. Uh, but we will come uh, to this point in a minute um, regarding how you can actually interact with me during this course, because this should be really something like an interactive course if you want to. <laughs> um, all right, so um, about this course. Um, this is an R course, um, a short workshop, so only three hours where well, um, I will teach you, hopefully teach you, how to use some geospatial techniques in R or use R as a geographic information system, uh, as we just learned. And um, my approach is always that I know people tend to have issues using R or other scripting languages. Um, maybe they have some anxieties to, to use the language. And my idea is that um, at the end of the course, you should be le less frightened to, to use uh, the actual language we use here today, and this is R. So um, you should be less frightened to use uh, geospatial data in R. And this includes general topics as such as um, importing data into R, which is really important, I guess, um, wrangling the data, um, so preparing data for, for further processing and exploring the data. And you should be able, and this is really something that is, um, uh, belongs to the topic of um, self-efficacy. Um, this is something you can always reach with geospatial data. You should be able to create at least some simple maps in R. So this is also really fun. Um, just a note here, uh, some materials uh, are part of some previous courses I've given with my colleagues, um, Anne and um, Anne Katrin Stroppe. And um, I also added some slides um, from uh, Libby Bishop um, about SESTA, um, as we will see in a minute. There are some uh, prerequisites uh, for this course. Um, so expecting at least basic knowledge uh, about R. Um, so you should be familiar with this general syntax, how you, for example, assign objects um, to functions and stuff like this, and um, should understand the general internal logic of R. Um, if not, it would be good if you have at least some affinity for script-based languages. So if you're familiar with, with Stata um, or SPSS or even Python, that um, doesn't hurt. And um, you should be prepared um, and not be scared at least uh, to, to wrangle data with um, complex structures. So not only spreadsheet data, but uh, yeah, let's say multidimensional data. And um, to conduct the exercises, um, we will have plenty of exercises during this course. It would be good uh, if you have um, working versions of R uh, installed on your computer. Um, ideally, it would be good if you also have uh, R Studio installed, but this is not nothing that um, um, you should really have um, for this course. Um, some words about me. Um, my name is Stefan Jünger, as you might know. I am a postdoctoral researcher in the team data augmentation at the GESIS department, survey data creation. And so I'm not from SESTA, if you will, I'm from GESIS Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. It's one of the largest uh, social science uh, infrastructures in, in Europe. Um, I have a PhD in social sciences, so I'm not a geographer uh, from the University of Cologne. And uh, I have a couple of research interests. Uh, interests um, for example, quantitative methods uh, more in general. Um, substantially, um, I'm interested in social inequalities and attitudes towards minorities, um, data management and data privacy, and also some topics like reproducible research and open sciences. Um, since we are a rather large group, um, I prepared something for you because I also want to know a bit about you. Um, this um, regards to, to, um, to, to your knowledge about R and geospatial data. So let me um, share a link with you. I posted here in the chat window. It would be nice if you just open this web page and uh, fill out uh, the survey. 
I have to start it now. And it's just um, a question about your experience with R and geospatial data, so that I can hopefully um, see um, what's your um, what's your starting point on this top on these two topics for this course. Um, yeah, because if you are already all um, really professional with using geospatial data, I could probably skip the general introduction to, ge to ge geospatial data, but I don't know about this beforehand, right? So hopefully, can you open that? I think it's just, mm, okay, people can open up. Okay, I have to send it to all of you, sorry. Here we go. Okay, that's interesting um, already. Um, so I've seen there are some people um, that should be familiar already with geospatial data, I guess. So uh, it might get boring in the next couple of minutes for you, uh, but it's important for, for all others that we um, actually start from the, from, from the beginning, right? So that they can also um, deal with um, the, the actual um, mapping and data wrangling of geospatial data. Um, but no, no, are experts so far, but that's not an issue, I guess. Um, I mean, I have this prerequisite of, of basic knowledge of R, but it's just uh, the application of some basic functions. So we won't write any large R scripts uh, during the exercises. So, so don't worry about this. Okay, I'm happy with that. So let's go ahead uh, with the actual um, workshop. Okay, as I said, um, this is a workshop, should be something like an interactive workshop, so you're allowed to post questions at any time. Um, there's this chat window, but we, you should use this Q&A window, I guess, uh, for, for, for um, this workshop. Um, you can also raise your hand and then ask questions at any time. Uh, that would be even better for me, <laughs> honestly, because then I, um, I can, yeah, it's, it's easier, than, uh, uh, easier than just um, watching the chat window and also talking at the same time. Um, so, but in general, this is a workshop that uh, is a combination of a few lectures and hands-on exercises uh, after each section. Um, slides and other materials are available at, my, at the GitHub repository for this course this morning. Um, and as I said, this will also be recorded and all slides and, and the other materials and also the recording will then be um, shared on SESA channels. Mm, but for the time being, I guess this morning would be good if you just um, maybe open um, this, um, this GitHub repository. I also post the link here. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with GitHub. Um, it's just a way of distribute my, my workshop materials for you. So if you're not familiar with uh, GitHub, just ignore everything up here. Um, it's just the um, directory structure uh, of the uh, repository or the workshop materials I have prepared. Um, may, might also be uh, interesting for a general uh, data management workshop, but just ignore it. Uh, what you can see here down here that is way more important is a general description of the workshop. You should know this description already. And um, you can access all slides uh, via clicking on these links here. This is rather important for you. I guess if you want to follow along having the slides open on your screen as well, so not only seeing the shared screen, um, um, slides on the shared screen, um, you can do that here just by clicking here on these um, on these hyperlinks. And uh, when we come to the actual exercises, um, you can click also here to open the exercises. And this is way more important, I guess, for you than just clicking on the slides. And you also, please 
only after um, um, conducting the exercise, you can also click on the solutions to have a look on the solutions of the uh, exercises. But we also come back to this um, when we actually um, come uh, reach uh, the first um, exercise. Um, it would be good if you actually download everything um, because then you are also able to access the data for the exercises. And you can do that via clicking on this code button here. And then you can just download everything um, um, as a zip file and, and open it in your, I don't know if you use Windows and your Windows Explorer, for example. And um, then you'll see this uh, folder structure here. And there's, for example, this data folder and there's the data stored for the exercises. And you can use this folder here, participant scripts, to store R scripts or um, work on R script um, for the exercises. Um, if you have any questions regarding that, we can also talk about this uh, during or before the exercises again. All right, um, this is the general um, course schedule for this morning. So we are currently in the introduction. Um, um, we will talk a bit about um, data management in general. So this is actual SESTA content and we will have a short introduction to geospatial data. Then we'll have our first um, exercise, or our warm-up session. So um, just to be um, sure that you have all packages installed for the exercises. And after that, we'll talk about um, the actual data wrangling, if you will. So data processing and something uh, like, which is called spatial linking or spatial overlay, spatial joints uh, that you can do in R. Um, and we'll have an exercise on that, rather longer exercise than, than the first one. Um, I, I won't be too strict, I guess, um, about the actual timing for all these sections, but I would like to be firm on the break that is scheduled for 10.30. So if I'm um, over my time, please remind me that it's now time for a break, because I know uh, probably a lot of people are in home office now, and um, it's always a mess with these virtual events, and it would be nice um, if you have a scheduled, scheduled break. Um, to, to, to do and get some coffee or um, other things to do. Um, and then we will start actually after the break um, with creating some maps. And uh, we also have an exercise on this map and we we'll, and we'll have a Q&A at the end of the, of the actual um, workshop. All right, um, so let's talk about um, data management first. Um, so this um, workshop is presented you, <laughs> to you by um, SESTA. And um, SESTA is the um, Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. Um, so the whole mission of, of SESTER is um, to, to help data archives or data providers in, in the first place to um, get their data distributed um, to um, data users. And um, SESTER is built around the idea that it would be nice or it would be beneficial for every uh, data archive in Europe if they team up and provide services um, to do that um, together um, and not only um, for their um, data users in their own um, home country, right? So um, it's really uh, something, SESA is really something that provides services for data providers, but also data users in the end. And it's also built about the idea of this fairly new, um, um, uh, fairly new buzzword called FAIR, um, FAIR data. So it's about um, having data that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And um, yeah, a lot of this um, um, is reached um, by um, yeah, giving training, such as these workshops here. Um, but uh, SESTA also have some other um, tools and services um, I'd like to show you here. So um, at the heart, for example, is this um, SESTA data catalog, catalog uh, where um, data from the different participating data archives are entered in that can be researched there. And um, I was asked also to present you the um, SESTER data management expert guide. And, and I think this is also um, really a great resource, um, not only for data providers, but also data users um, to learn not only the basics of data management, but also get some in-depth knowledge about data management. Um, I've just learned that this screenshot here, so this is the starting page of the Data Management Expert Guide, um, is not the most current one. <laughs> so they changed it, I guess, last week. Um, so I'm going to switch to the actual home page. And um, the Data Management Expert Guide is actually really um, an online resource that you can use that provides some, some training on, on topics of um, data management. 
And you can see the, the actual topics here on the left. So it really refers to all phases of, of data management. So starting actually with the planning of, of, of a study, for example, um, organizing, documenting your data, which is also quite, uh, quite important. And um, I learned that this workshop um, refers to, to the actual phase of processing data. So we um, just open this point here and you will see there's um, a drop down uh, menu. And then we will see some more topics on um, um, processing data. Um, to be honest, a lot of these topics refer more to the um, ordinary social science uh, data, such as survey data. So um, for, for example, all these coding sections um, are more about this um, classic survey data, quantitative or qualitative um, survey data. But um, other topics for, for example, data entry and, and integrity also, um, or for file formats and, and, and file con conversion um, really also um, is an important topic in geospatial data as we will learn in a minute. So um, what I'd like to, to, to do with, with showing you everything here is just um, to, to invite you to, to actually have a look at this um, data management expert guys, even if uh, a lot of topics today are not necessarily covered here, but I guess uh, at least most of you are actually social scientists. So it's really a resource that is rich uh, for all of you. And uh, it makes your life um, nowadays uh, when, when you have, for example, funding and uh, people are you're required to have proper data management, it makes your life way easier. Um, the link to the expert guide, sure, sorry. Okay, uh, here we go. So it's also will be on, on all slides. Um, can also post it here, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, so please have a look here. Um, um, as I said, this is about processing today. So we are in phase of data wrangling. So um, let's pretend that we have already planned our study and stuff like this. And we are now uh, at the phase of, of entering data uh, and processing for further analysis. Okay. So let's come to geospatial data. So now we're gonna start with the actual topic, uh, uh, if you will, um, of this course. So we need a definition. Um, what are geospatial data? And a really broad definition would be that this is data, as any other data, um, that has something like, which is called a direct spatial reference. This could be, um, for example, an identifier for a municipality, um, an indirect spatial reference, on the other hand, would be uh, a name of a municipality. But this is ambiguous, uh, right? Um, I usually tend to stick to a more narrow um, definition of geospatial data, and this would be um, data that um, has or where the observations of the data are associated with at least one geocoordinate, so an X and Y variable. And these geocoordinates are then um, can build just a point. So this is a point um, um, which we also, in a more general sense, would call a geometry because um, it can be uh, shown uh, on the map. Um, so it comprises information about geomet geometries, uh, geospatial data. Um, but there can also be um, actual content associated with these geometries. So on the right-hand side, you see some examples for these geometries. So um, the first case are actual points and, and this is actually really something is just geocoordinate and these can be addresses of for example survey respondents or um, hospital locations in a more complicated case um, when you connect several geocoordinates um, to to a line these can be roads still comprises geocoordinates but they are not connected with a line if you um, connect the, all these lines together, you can build uh, polygons. Um, these can then be, for example, um, shapes of, of municipality boundaries. So it's not only the identifier of a municipality, you get the actual shape of a, a municipality. And there's a, another often used case of geospatial data structures uh, or geometries. This would be a grid data or raster data. So uniform, um, uniformly or evenly shaped um, a rectangular um, geometries, if you will. And this is often used, for example, to um, describe land use data. So green 
green areas in the neighborhood often um, distributed um, as um, grids or raster data. And um, yeah, what is the main advantage of, of associating observations and data with geocoordinates. And the main advantage is that you can um, jointly project all these um, resources or yeah, data sources in one single space. And this, is, this allows the linking of these data and extraction of substantial inf information from these data. Uh, we will have a couple of um, data sources for this course uh, that are stored in this um, data folder I've just shown you in the GitHub repository. Um, yeah, we're still in the pandemic and uh, I was hoping that um, this, this, I don't know, example is obsolete, but uh, currently in Germany the, the, the uh, numbers are rising, so it's still relevant. And we will use um, COVID-19 cases uh, just for the city of Cologne um, as an example data set uh, for several cities' districts. Um, we will have to use um, data on hospital locations in Cologne as well. We'll have data on Cologne's road network, just for illustration. And we will have data um, about immigrants and inhab inhabitants from the German census 2011. So it's really specific to Germany, but um, you can um, abstract from this to two other data sources from other countries as well. So don't worry about this. Um, another term we have to, to clarify is then again a geographic information system or GIS and in the most common understanding um, GIS um, is just a specific software that you can use for um, to process geospatial data to visualize it creating a map for example and to analyzing geospatial data. Um, in a more broader sense it's an actual framework that also comprises um, issues of data management for example. And um, yeah, down here on the, on the screenshot might be a bit small, uh, small, um, not that okay to see, um, is the example um, of a GIS, um, also an open source GIS, um, quantum GIS. Um, and this is really just um, yeah, like, like a visual tool. So you can use um, geospatial data files and use drop and, drop and uh, yeah, click and drop. Um, to load them there and it's just for visualization for example. You can also analyze data in there. Uh, you can also use Python um, to um, um, interfere with, with the data as well. Um, this is just one prominent example of GIS that you might often see and that I would also recommend to download if you're uh, interested in, in working more, more with um, geospatial data in the future. Okay, there are several data specifics. Um, regarding geospatial data or even more data specifics if you will. Um, one is formats and this directly refers to the different geometries that we have just seen um, previously. So um, these points or lines or polygons data are often also called vector data and these grid or raster data or yeah, grid data often are called raster data. Um, we come back to this topic again and we will use both different data types um, during uh, this workshop. Um, another important data specific are coordinate reference systems or CRS. Um, these are the actual tools or the facilitators of um, projecting um, data in one single space and also on Earth surface. And they differ in precision for specific purposes. So some coordinate reference systems are for, for example, navigation purposes. In this, these cases, it doesn't matter if um, they are um, that specific that, it, I don't know, the, the, the um, duration is one second long, longer or shorter than uh, calculated, I don't know, in Google Maps, for example. Uh, but there are um, use cases where it's really important that it's uh, that uh, detailed. And um, there are actually two different types of CRS. Uh, one are um, projected CRS. Um, this is something you might have seen already uh, in the past. Um, um, Google Maps have used uh, projected CRS, um, but they are also um, so-called geographic CRS, um, where it more or less resembles Earth's curvature. Um, and the difference is that these projected CRS um, project um, all geometries, so for example, points or lines, on a flat surface, so it's really a flat earth, as you can see here, and the distance between two points are an actual straight line. And in the case of these um, geographic CRS, um, also called unprojected um, 
um, coordinate reference systems, um, the um, description of the, the points or geometries are on a sphere. So they resemble more or less Earth curvature. This is why it looks like, like that. And the distance between two points is then a bent line. So it's a bit more realistic, if you will. And um, there are also other types of CRS um, where you can also, for example, um, um, create mountains or um, yeah, describe mountains with. So it also requires Z coordinate. And what is really important when you work with your spatial data, and especially from different data sources, is that the, the layers, also called layers, so if you load in one data set and another data set, they comprise individual layers because they are layered on top of each other, that they must match so that they have the same coordinate reference system. Um, because uh, this is really um, the prerequisite to work with geospatial data to, to link them and to extract one information from one data set and add it to another. And um, yeah, I would be happy if I can say that this uh, would be then everything is fine as long as they match. Um, unfortunately, the world of CRS, um, at least at the moment, is a bit more difficult and also in, in using R because um, there are different ways of, of defining coordinate reference systems. Don't worry too much about it, <laughs> just uh, beforehand. Uh, um, it will be, will get a bit easier to work with this uh, during the course, but it's um, important for you that you at least heard that there are different um, types of definitions of CRS. And, and one is the, um, yeah, let's call it old standard, the PR or G4 strings. It's actually a description of how points or geometries should be projected on Earth's surface. Don't worry too much about the details in the here, but this is something you might um, face when you work with geospatial data, not only in R, these uh, PROG4 strings. And currently, or yeah, unfortunately, there's currently a um, transition from this old standard to a newer standard. It's called well-known text. Um, in R, um, it looks like this, um, more or less the same information, it's just arranged a bit differently. Um, I mean, this is something you might know also from, from, from other applications that um, an XML file looks different than a CSV file, but you can also um, uh, display the same uh, information within, in each files. Um, and um, yeah, but you might get some warnings when you use R um, that um, yeah, something might, uh, might be a bit um, messed up in your data. So you always have to check your data, especially when you use some, some older R package or some um, in combination with some current ones. Um, but don't worry too much about this. This is just a warning message and um, yeah, we can navigate these issues. The good news is uh, most of the time you don't have to use PROG4 PR strings or well-known text. You can simply use EPS, EPSG codes. And um, these are some small digit sequences um, that, um, yeah, let the system know that um, you are want to enter all this information that are in the PRG, PROG4 string, sorry about this, um, entered in your data. So um, we don't have to use these longer strings, simply put. You can just enter, I'd like to uh, use this and this projection, and then you just use the um, small digit sequence uh, for this purpose. So um, what we will use is a um, European system of uh, coordinate reference systems, and uh, it has this uh, small digit sequence of 3035, and, and we will use that during the course um, when we um, define the CRS, but also when we transform um, coordinates um, from one system to another. So don't worry too much about it. There are even more details on geospatial data, but we will learn about this uh, when we um, actually start uh, with the um, actual coding. Um, and we will learn on them what, more about um, vector data and raster data. Um, just to assure you, um, I mean, things might get a bit complicated already, uh, but R can serve as a full-blown geographic information system nowadays. Uh, so this is the main takeaway message I'd like to um, give you um, in this course. Uh, don't worry too much about using CRS. It's not different to, to other um, GIS, um, but um, yeah, R can cope with that. So be aware of that. 
And um, I mean, geospatial data is not new um, to R. Um, there are, have been some packages already for a long time in R. Um, one prominent example for vector data, for example, is the ESP package. For raster data, there's the raster package. There's also a successor, the Terra package. What we will use uh, during this workshop are some cutting edge um, packages for vector data and raster data. So we won't use the, these old packages, but um, if you do your research um, on, or stick around on, on stack chains, for example, if you have some specific questions about uh, R, um, you will see some solutions using all these, um, let's say, older packages as well. Um, what we use is the SF package, um, stands for simple features that um, um, respects or is, um, yeah, is using a ISO standards uh, for geospatial data. And we will also use the STARS package, which is the cutting edge package, if you will, for raster data. We have um, some more R packages in this course we will use. Um, it's, for example, the plier package, um, the TMAP package for creating maps, and TMAP tools, uh, which also facilitates creating maps. Um, and this will be installed by you, hopefully, in a minute uh, during the exercise. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, with R, um, what you will see uh, nevertheless during the course is um, piping in R. And um, there's always this distinction between base R, so how R comes installed, and this um, modern tidyverse approach towards R. Um, tidyverse is just a collection of, of packages for, for, for data sciences. And um, what I will use um, is the, the pipe operator. Um, on my slides. You don't have to use this during the exercise, but it's always a bit easier actually to understand uh, the application of functions. And it's, um, it's really easy to apply. Um, so usually what you do in R when you, when you um, apply a function, you um, yeah, have your function name. So this is just uh, a toy example. So the function name is F. Um, you have your opening brackets. Um, and um, then you um, have your arguments, for example, enter a data set. So if you want to run a linear regression in R, it would be the LM argument and it will enter the data then and the formula for that. And in the logic of pipes, um, this, um, this is um, disentangled, if you will. So uh, we will start with the actual data object or the actual argument, and then we have this pipe operator. And this is then entered into the function in the next step. For this simple function, it doesn't make any sense to, to write it that way, but sometimes you have nested functions. So you have one function um, and um, you want to apply, um, for example, you want to, to um, uh, round um, numbers, uh, and then you will nest this uh, into, within another function. And, and then the logic of pipes, you could write it that way. So we will start with the um, actual object, we'll feed it in the first function, and this result then using the pipe operator will be fed into the next function and so on. Um, this is really a simple application of, of pipes. Um, don't worry, you don't have to apply them by yourself if you don't want to, but you will also see them um, on my slides, but also um, um, yeah, on the solutions of the exercises. Okay, speaking about exercises, um, I've prepared first exercise on the five, maybe 10 minutes, um, for um, an R warm-up session. Um, so if you open the exercises, I can also, um, let me see, um, copy the link again. If you um, open the exercises, oh, I can't copy and paste, sorry. Okay, let me first open the exercise and then I will post the link. Um, it, was, it will open um, an HTML document uh, within text at the beginning and the actual exercises. So exercises um, are defined or denoted with this um, star here. So here's the text of the, of the exercise and the first exercise that, will, that I would like to ask you is to um, install all packages that are listed on the slide we have just seen. So for example, the plier package or the SF package uh, on the introduction slides. Um, I always add some clues. So if you maybe struggle with conducting the exercises or want to find out more elegant ways of finding solution, you can have a look here on the clues um, section here. And um, so, yeah, please um, start with the first exercise. Um, you can, um, I think the best way would be actually to, to click again on this um, GitHub repo. I've posted the link here in the chat. Um, and then 
sorry, a lot of tabs open here, and just can click here on this um, hyperlink here and it will open the exercise. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, please ask them right now or in the chat or wherever you want to. Okay, I just saw that I got this uh, one question wrong by, by Amir. Um, the, the question was about um, the list of all my already installed packages, right? So I don't know if you use R Studio um, because I'm not sure how you, uh, there must be a way also in, in other environments to to, um, have, to create such a list, but it's really easy to do uh, when you use um, R Studio because, um, so let me, uh, move my window here. Um, so our studio has this different panes, uh, it's called, so these different windows here. And there's also um, this pane here um, down with all the files and then there's this package packages tab. And um, there's the actual list of our all installed packages uh, on your system and also the loaded. So you can also load um, packages um, by clicking just here. Um, you can also uninstall packages by clicking on this um, button here. Um, so this would be one way, um, at least in R Studio, they could use um, to, to have a list of all your R, uh, already installed packages. So maybe you already have uh, some packages installed here. So if you're a user of, of the Tidyverse, uh, you might already have um, the deployer package installed on your system. Are there any other issues with installing these packages? Maybe they are still installing, so it might take a while that they are actually installed. So, but any struggles? Because if not, I will just just show you the solution of this exercise. And I mean, if you had had some struggles uh, with with installing the packages, you could just use my solutions while I'll. Um, proceed with the uh, workshop uh, or the next section of the workshop in a minute. Okay, just gonna close um, this window here. So the warm up exercise uh, solutions. Um, so I, I had included in, in the clues um, the, the use of, of, of another package as well. The issue is that you are using an old version of R. I don't know how old your version is, um, but what it's telling you is that um, the SF package was built under a more recent um, version of R. Um, yeah. So what, what, what are you missing is the units package. What you can use uh, or try is to um, install or try to install the um, units package manually. Maybe this would also already fix your issue with this old version. So using this command. Um, if not, um, let's talk about this um, during the next exercise, okay? Um, all right, so I propose to, to use the easy packages um, package um, because this is really convenient to um, load and also install packages um, at the same time. So you just, just use the, the command packages and um, define um, the, the package names as character strings, and then it will either load all packages or install them if they are not already installed. And um, yeah, the second ex exercise, if you will, was just um, another illustration of some issues that might occur when you use different coordinate reference systems. So there's this um, yeah, rather old discussion about this using um, this Mercator projection. So this is uh, one of the um, flat surface uh, projections that distort, um, for example, Greenland is a an, is an prominent example. It's always way too big. Um, and Africa, on the other hand, is way too small in comparison to other countries such as the USA or Europe. Um, so I just, um, just I think, a nice exercise uh, to, to have a more visual experience with um, differences in coordinate reference systems. OK. If there are no other questions uh, as of now, I will continue with um, the actual data processing um, of geospatial data in R. So now it's getting really on the to, into the topic of um, geospatial data in R. No, sorry. Here we go. Okay. 
Now it's about data processing and also spatial linking. So the um, idea of um, extracting, for example, information from one data set to another via this projection of one single space. And why should you care now about um, different data types and da different data formats in the first place? And um, I mean, the most obvious um, reason is that you need different commands to import the data and you need different commands to um, handle the data, to process the data. And um, also um, these um, spatial linking techniques and, and also the analysis of this data is at least partially uh, determined by the data format. I mean, you are able to um, transform or convert one data type into another. So for example, you can uh, convert uh, a vector data format into a raster data format and vice versa. But um, it always comes, um, um, yeah, at least with some disadvantages or with also information loss uh, sometimes. And um, also visualization of the data can also differ. And this is especially important when you want to create a maps in R. On the right-hand side, you see <clears throat> another illustration of um, different um, data um, types, um, geospatial data types, and also an illustration of this spatial linking or spatial join, or it's also often called spatial overlay. <clears throat> so the idea is here that you have different layers of geospatial data. On the bottom, for example, this is a road network in Cologne. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm not gonna lose my voice, not today. Um, then you see um, some district boundaries um, for different, different um, cities' districts. You see uh, land use information, so soil ceiling, it's called. You see, um, this is an example, for example, for raster data. And um, you see information uh, about immigrants, uh, also another um, example of raster data. And you see a layer of uh, road traffic noise. And the idea is that, for example, you can project the point into these spaces uh, or the, into the space on these different layers. And you can, for example, extract the decibel value of this road traffic noise uh, for the specific point um, using a geographic information system. Um, I mean, you have already seen that. Um, just again, there's this obvious visual difference between vector data and raster data. So vector data, again, are points, lines, polygons. And raster data, most of the time, are evenly shaped or uniformly shaped um, grids um, for a whole surface, uh, for example, from a country. Um, but there are more formal um, differences as well. So. Um, the idea behind vector data is that um, this is why often observations in these data are called features, so that each of these real world features are uh, represented by these different um, types of geometry. So for example, the points and the lines and the polygons, and these geometries are not necessarily fixed. In the case of points, they are fixed, um, but for polygons, they differ between different observations in the data set. And regarding raster data, the information most of the time um, comprises evenly shaped grid cells. So all observations do have the same shape. And they are basically a simple data table, if you will, as we will see in a minute as, as well. Um, so each cell then represents one observation. So not each um, geometry is an observation, uh, each cell is, a, um, is an observation. And um, yeah, there are three types of information in, in vector data. Um, one is um, the location, so this um, comprises um, to where something is stored, the length as well, so this is also important for lines and polygons, and the, um, yeah, the size of the area as well, so in case of polygons. And um, what we usually have uh, when we deal with vector data are um, attribute tables, so these are simple data tables. Um, that comprises rows, so such as a such as in the survey data set, and uh, these rows um, are the geometries or the observations, um, also called observations, case, feature, um, and um, we have columns, and this is also similar to to um, other um, data types that uh, these columns are um, variables or it's often called attributes, and here's an example uh, just to make this point clear. Um, so let's pretend we, we have a um, vector data set comprising points um, in Germany. So what you see here is a, is a map of, of Germany with four points. 
and we know the longitude and the latitudes or the x of y variables um, of these points. So we know where to uh, project them on, on, on the map. And we have um, some more information associated with each point. So for example, if they comprise um, the city center of, of different towns in, in Germany, uh, we, for example, would have um, a city name or the population size um, um, associated um, just via adding these in, in the attribute table. And for raster data, uh, it's a bit different. So we don't have this logic of attribute tables. Um, so um, the information about the geometries are globally stored. So we don't have the location for each um, raster cell, um, um, for each observation or each cell stored in, in one, um, one row. Um, so it's really something like, like metadata. Um, and the location in space is uh, determined or defined by the cell location in the data table. Um, and the resolution of the cells um, are also stored as metadata. And um, what you also um, often face is that raster data only comprise one attribute. So you don't have this logic of attribute tables having a name or the population size. It's just about one feature, one attribute, one variable. Um, but there's um, sometimes um, the, the, the case of um, several bands that are used um, for uh, red, green, blue bands. Um, this is something we will see later on, but don't worry about this. This is more or less something like, like um, having more variables uh, in a data set. And again, um, the whole idea is that uh, we have just one data table, a rectangular data matrix, that is um, with the addition of metadata then converted to a raster file format. So for example, we have this table here, and these values just um, comprise different values of, of the variable we are interested in. And uh, we define um, where this um, raster layer is, store, uh, is um, located. So is it Germany or is it just one city? So this is um, uh, metadata. And we also define the, the size of these um, uh, raster cells or grid cells here. And then it's converted to a raster cell. Um, we will create our own raster data in a minute, so don't worry about this. Um, there are different file formats then. So this was just about data types. So this is the general logic, um, but there are several data formats. Uh, for vector data, one of the most prominent ones and that you might also already know are shape files. Um, this is a commercial um, or proprietary data format. Um, comprises several files. So this is a bit ambiguous, uh, this name shapefile, because it has um, information about, um, about um, yeah, the, um, the, the shape of the geometries. It has um, one file for the actual attribute table. It has one file for the um, definition of the coordinate reference system and so on. So um, usually it might be a good idea to, to stick with a more open formats, such as GeoJSON and, and all other ones as well. But just be aware there are different file formats for vector data. And the same holds true for raster data as well. So one of the most prominent ones are um, uh, GTIFs. Um, TIFF is a, just an image format and GTIFF stands for geo. So a geo TIFFs uh, is another name for this. Uh, this is a prominent example for raster data as well. But they are also, for example, JPEG. Um, so as an image, uh, um, uh, image, um, um, image file, um, um, also um, associated with uh, geospatial data or vector data, uh, raster data, sorry. All right, so now we're coming to the actual R section. So to import vector data in R, uh, we would use the SF package uh, nowadays. And there's this um, um, stread um, function you could use just to load, um, let's say any vector data file format you would you can possibly imagine. So you can load shape files, um, GeoJSON files, and so on with this command. Um, same holds true for um, um, this function's uh, sister uh, from the stars package. It's the read underscore stars function to load in um, raster TIFF files, but also other file formats for raster data. So this is more or less all you have to remember to load in uh, vector data or raster data into R. So that's pretty easy, right? Um, here's one example to uh, where I um, import um, the uh, Corona cases for Cologne uh, into R using this um, read SF function. 
So again, uh, you use the read sf function. We define the location of this shape file. And what is, what is quite convenient with this function as well is that you don't have to define uh, all other additional files of the shape file. So you don't have to define the attribute table or the file for the projection. You just have to define the shp file, which is, uh, comprises the shapes of the geometries. And we associate it or assign it to a new object name called uh, Corona Colon. So this is what we're doing here. And if you print it into your R console, what you get, um, sorry, it's a bit big here, so it doesn't fit on the screen. But what you can see here is um, some information about this data file. Um, so this is the output of the SF package. Um, so we see that this is a simple feature collection. So simple feature as, as an SF with 86 features, so 86 observations and eight fields. Eight fields is stands again for, for variables or attributes. So uh, as you can see, terms differ um, between dis different disciplines that all handle geospatial data. So this is a bit puzzling, I guess. And uh, we also see the geometry type. So this is a multi-polygon. So um, not just a polygon, it comprises polygons that com comprises several polygons that stick together. So it's not only points or lines, but, but polygons. And um, some more information, for example, about the CRS, but we don't have to worry about this at the moment. And then what we receive is a simple data table. This is really a nice feature of this SF package that um, the data are displayed as a simple data table. Um, unfortunately, the names are in, in German, but we, um, I will translate them as, as we will code along. Um, so we don't need all of these variable here. And um, so for example, for example, we have an ID variable, um, we have a name of the city district, and we have the, uh, for example, um, corona cases in each district in the last seven days. And in the last row, um, you can see it here, is information about the actual geometry. And you can print this geometry also uh, by using this command, um, or just um, extracting this variable from the data set. So what we do here is um, using this, this um, defined uh, object, um, corona underscore cologne, and we just extract the geometry column. And this makes the whole data set or the whole data table to a geospatial data set, um, just by the definition of this geomod geometry column. And it comprises just points that are stick together um, to a polygon. Uh, it also um, doesn't fit here because these, these um, shapes are rather complex and comprises a lot of points, but this is the whole magic about using uh, geospatial data or polygon status uh, in this case um, in R. And um, we will use another data set, and this time it's not that complicated, it's these hospitals uh, locations in Cologne. So again, we will use the, the read underscore sf function. Um, we will read in the um, data set, and um, again, if you print it out, it's really similar, but this time it's not a polygon. It's a points data set, uh, comprises less features, um, but more fields. And um, yeah, it comprises locations, uh, more or less, um, of the hospital locations. And this time, uh, the geometry column uh, looks um, less frightening, I guess. So it's just, it just comprises uh, X and Y variables for these points, uh, location points of, of the hospitals. And what is nice, about uh, these simple features objects in R that it's really easy to um, create a map or, or first map uh, to, um, to have a look at this data. So um, you can use the, the plot command from, uh, from base R or this generic function for, from R to actually have a look of cor at corona cases uh, in R, uh, in, in, in this data set. So this, um, um, this variable um, with this, not that nice name um, are the corona cases uh, in each district, um, um, the sum of all cases um, during the whole pandemic. And you can just use uh, this plot command to have a first map. And um, same holds true, for example, for the hospitals data. If you plot them um, with this, um, with the name of the, of the city district, uh, you get a map or first map uh, of the points in space. Um, as well. And it's fairly easy um, to use this uh, simple feature objects to create, for example, new variables. So it's really just, just a data table, if you will. I mean, it's multidimensional because you have this information about the geometries, but to work with it, you just uh, can use it as a um, flat um, data table, if you will. 
Uh, for example, if you want to create something like, like an incidence number, so we Germans uh, like to stick to, to our incidences when we talk about uh, this corona pandemic, you can create uh, this variable just uh, using uh, the mutate function from the deplier package. Um, if you're not familiar with the deplier package, just a way to create new variables in R um, with this function here. So um, we have this um, variable that we want to define, it should be called incidence. And we use this formula here um, to create this incidence number as well. And if we apply this function and again, assign it to, to our um, already defined object, we will get this variable added to the data set. And then you can again, uh, plot the incidence number uh, in the same way as before. So as I said, um, the main advantage of using geospatial data are, is the flexibility of geometric operations. Um, I mean, we created new variables based on the same data set. This is something you could also do with simple spreadsheet data. But um, what is so nice about geospatial data that you can um, link data from different data sets to another or make geometric operations. So um, one example would be, um, I mean, we have this, this, this information about our incidences in each city's district. Maybe you will also want to know how many um, hospitals are located in each district. And um, yeah, this is fairly easy to do um, with the use of GIS. So this is not specific to R, but this is the way how we would do it in R. So what we do is to project, theoretically uh, project the corona and the hospital data in one space. And we then just count how many hospitals are in each district. Um, and uh, so how many fall in each polygon of the district as well. Um, we we'll first have to um, check if the data is valid. So this is something that might often occur when you work with your spatial data that you get some error messages that um, data are not valid. And there's an easy function that you can use in the SF package. It's the um, ST make valid function, uh, you can just apply it, um, just a side note, just a footnote, um, be aware that this might occur and then you can just use this command and then everything is, should be fixed, hopefully. And um, so what we now have to do is to detect um, containing geometries. Um, so we have to know which hospital is contained in which um, city district. And there's Again, a nice function in the, in the SF package called st underscore contains, where you define your focal data set. So for the Corona Cologne data set, we want to know how many of the hospital's um, points uh, fall into each um, polygon. And we assign it to a, a new object called containing. And if you print out this, or if you apply this function and print out this containing, um, containing object, what we then receive um, is a list actually of all IDs in the Corona Cologne um, data set and the counts of, of hospitals in there. So we see in the first observation of this data set, there are no hospitals. In the second one, then there are 11. And there are a lot of um, districts that then have, don't have any hospitals, but there are some with a lot of hospitals, right? And this is just um, a vector in our logic with the length of the observations of the hospital of the corona cologne data set and um, what you can do um, sorry no this was wrong so <laughs> this was an error it, what this it doesn't give you the actual counts what it gives you is the the id of the other um, of the other of the hospital cologne um, um, so it, it it determines or shows you the the ID of the of the uh, hospitals uh, locations. So it's not not about the number of of hospitals, it's about of the ID of the actual uh, hospital. So as you can see down here, for example, there are several IDs denoted. Sorry for that. Um, what you have to do to actually get the counts is then use the length command in R. Uh, this is. Uh, the one you see here. So what we do is uh, use the, the length command. So it um, counts how many occurrences of IDs are in each, um, in each um, element. And uh, what you then get is the actual count. So if you print out the, the count, so the, the new object that I assigned here, um, you will receive um, the counts. So uh, in the second observation, it's not 11, 
uh, it's one hospital with the ID 11. But uh, as you can see here, there are some districts that have uh, more than one hospital in their, um, in their district. And you can add, and this is the convenient way now, you can just add this um, new, um, yeah, this, this vector as a new variable to your um, already existing um, Corona Cologne data set. Uh, again, using the mutate uh, command. So we define a new variable called hospitals underscore count, and we just assign this um, object up here. And then you can create, for example, a map uh, with the incidence numbers. Um, so if you print two variables and the hospital counts as well. And as you can see, there's, for example, one uh, district in Cologne, it's called Lindenthal. There are a lot of hospitals, for example. Okay, there are even more geometric um, so-called confirmation methods. So it's, it's, it's something checking, making, making sure something is um, associated um, with a specific geometry in, um, uh, in, in R and, and also general in GIS. Uh, this is just an example from, from a sheet sheet uh, you could from the SF package, um, but we won't deal with them um, for this workshop because it might get too, uh, too much, I guess, simply put. Okay, um, now we will turn to, to raster data. So these were uh, vector data um, um, operations. We will now turn to um, raster data. And for this purpose, we will use information about immigrant shares also in Cologne. And this is just a toy or research question. Um, it's not new, it's not from me, um, but um, something we've learned during this pandemic that um, not all social groups are um, um, affected by the virus um, the same. So, I mean, there are jobs li like probably ours where we can uh, stick all the time in the home office and we are not at risk to, ge to getting infected, but um, there are people with other jobs or other social groups um, that are, have a higher risk of being affected by, um, um, yeah, by COVID-19. And one of these groups, uh, for example, are immigrants as well. So this is something that we found out uh, in Germany as well, that immigrants do have a higher risk of getting affected. And uh, we can resemble this research as well using our Corona Cologne data, but also uh, immigrant share data from the um, German census 2011. So what we will do now is um, load in um, this data set into R using the read underscore stars function. And it's similar to the, um, um, to the st underscore um, read function from the SF package. So we have to find the location of the data set. Again, it's in this data folder. And this time it doesn't have this um, ext SHP extension, but this TIFF extension, um, which is a raster data set. And we assign it to um, an object name immigrants underscore Cologne. And this is um, information about the immigrants count uh, in Cologne. Um, and this time it looks a bit different uh, than, um, than the, the vector data. So we don't have this, this plain data table again, even though Russell data, <laughs> this is a bit um, ironic, uh, is more or less just a data table. Um, we get information about um, some, about the dimensions of the, of the object. So how large are the, um, the, the actual gr raster grid cells. This is something that is shown down here. Um, so delta is the number. So it's uh, one hectogrid cells, um, uh, raster data, 100 meters times 100 meters. And we get information about the um, so-called attribute uh, in there. So we have the count of uh, immigrants. Um, the smallest number is three because there are some um, data protection measures uh, in there. So below three, it's not, not shown. Uh, and the um, highest number uh, is 639, for example. All right. Um, and um, we do the same for the inhabitants um, um, in each grid cells in, in Cologne. So it's basically the same. Uh, again, we assign it to an object inhabitants underscore Cologne. Here's the location of the, of the raster um, file. And uh, this time, I mean, again, it's, it's similar. We have this data protection measures in, measure, in place, and we have information about um, the actual resolution, for example, of this raster cell. And we, again, can use this plot command, for this generic plot function in R, to have a first look at the data set. And here's the um, immigrants Cologne data set, for example, a plot of that or a map of it. It looks a bit different, right, to com comparison to the vector data. So it's really a small scale resolution data. Um, yeah really sensitive, if you will. Um, and um, yeah, 
this is for the immigrants, and this would be the map for inhabitants. Looks a bit, I mean, you have to zoom in, I guess, to, to see some actual differences. But what we can do now is to um, calculate the actual immigrant share with these um, two um, data sets. Because now we only have the counts of immigrants and the counts of inhabitants, and we can easily calculate an immigrant share or immigrant rate uh, out of these two numbers. And this can easily be done um, in, in R. Uh, it's just like, like dealing with two different um, vectors in R as well. Um, so what we use is a simple formula to calculate in, in share of, of a number. So immigrants underscore cologne times 100 and divided by um, the layer or the, the inhabitants information. And what we'll then do is just compare these two data sets. And it's really easy to, to uh, create a new variable out of it. It's different to, to using uh, the SF objects or simple features or vector data objects where you use the mutate function. This is the way you would, uh, that you would use uh, creating new variables for raster data and, and with using the stars package at least. And what we also do is uh, define a new name for this data set uh, using the space R function here. And then again, uh, yeah, we have um, a new um, raster data set um, with an attribute called immigrant rate. Uh, now we ranging from um, 0.6% to 100%. So it's really the immigrant share on each raster grid cell. And again, with the same resolution as the uh, previous uh, loaded um, raster data sets. And then we can also plot it uh, using the plot command. And then we see, for example, that um, on the, uh, yeah, more to, to, to the east side of, of Cologne, there's a higher immigrant share, um, for example. So there are also differences in neighborhoods, um, if you will, um, in, in Cologne. And um, something you would often like to, to do um, in, in com uh, when you combine vector data or raster data is that you extract information from raster data. So raster extraction is a really common procedure you would use um, in R. And um, so for example, my idea was, uh, I mean, we have it, we now have data on, on city districts in Cologne and we know how many Corona uh, cases have been there. We know the, the number of, of hospitals. Now we want to use, uh, now what's the mean immigrant share in each district, for example. So we have to aggregate or, yeah, or extract information from, from the raster data set by aggregating it uh, to the city district level. And there's the aggregate function in the stars package as well that you can use for this, um, for this effort. So um, what we do here, we want to create a new data set, extracted immigrants, it's called, and we use the aggregate function now. Um, in the first step, we define um, where um, the rest information is coming from. And it's this immigrant cologne data set. Come back to this in a minute here. And we want to know by, um, by which um, other vector, in this case, vector attribute, uh, vector feature we want to do this. And I mean, we want to aggregate it on the level of the city district. So we define the Corona Cologne, uh, Corona Cologne data set here uh, for this argument. And we can define a function. So I suggested that we use the, the mean function. So the mean immigrant share in each district, um, we exclude missing values. But for example, you could also use um, um, the sum of immigrants. Doesn't make too much sense here now because we already have this um, immigrant share variable, but this is something you could do or could also can apply a custom function here as well. Um, something that is um, um, complicating things here is that the immigrant share data set and the um, corona um, cases data sets do have different uh, coordinate reference systems. So what we use here um, is a function to transform the, um, the immigrant share data uh, set to the, um, uh, to the coordinate reference system of the corona um, cases um, data sets. So um, the immigrants Cologne data set is in this um, CRS with the EPSG code 3035, I just uh, mentioned earlier, and we now convert it to the uh, projection uh, 4326, just as it is. And we, I used just the pipe operator to apply it, right? 
And um, what is f funny about this, this um, creates another um, raster data set that's now aggregated to the level of city districts. So we now have um, um, information about um, the mean share in each district. And um, we don't have this information about resolution anymore because it's not a, um, a raster data set anymore. It's now a vector data set, but represented in, within the stars package. So this might be a bit complicated. But adding this information to the um, corona um, cases data set is fairly easy. Um, again, we would use, simply use the mutate function to find a new variable um, called immigrants. And uh, we use the um, just uh, create a data set and uh, just add the first list element because it's actually a list um, to this data set. And what we then have is a new variable with the immigrant shares in each city district. And this is how it looks like when you plot it again. So we have our incidences, we have um, immigrants, um, and we have, uh, sorry, you know, uh, yes, <laughs> we have incidents, we have hospitals, but we also have now this immigrants um, variable here. And again, we, we see on the more in the, in the eastern side of, of, um, of Cologne, there is a higher immigrant share um, on the mean level as well. All right. Um, there's much more you could do with geospatial data. Um, so what I'd often like to call it is, is, is the researcher's degree of freedom. So this is really huge. Um, so um, you can also, for example, use um, different scales on different sonation methods. So on the right-hand side, for example, you see an example uh, of a method. This is pretty common also in the social sciences nowadays. If you have georeference server data, for example, so you have a point location of a server respondent, and you not only extract the, um, the value of a raster data set at this specific location, instead you um, create a circle or buffer around a respondent's location and you extract the mean value, for example, from that. And then you can, for example, vary the size of this circular buffers. And uh, my recommendation would be that you should do it uh, theory driven. Uh, this is uh, most of the time the, the, the best idea you could uh, follow because um, permutation is really crazy and the researcher's degree of freedom is crazy. Um, and what we are also missing is um, actual analysis of, analysis of geospatial data. So it can get really sophisticated. Um, geospatial data are often clustered. Um, so there's a spatial dependency between um, observations and geospatial data. And there are specialized, for example, regression methods you could use where you model and test the spatial dependence and, and for example, model diffusion processes from one geospatial observation to another. So this is something that's also missing here in this course because we, in the next step we will come uh, back to, uh, or we will proceed with, with mapping. And um, yeah, just, just a nice resource uh, of another sociologist uh, using geospatial methods um, that is more a bit more in depth um, regarding uh, geospatial analysis so um, yeah to get a first idea this is a wonderful resource so yeah there's a lot more um, i could teach you in, in maybe a more days workshop than just um, this three hour workshop um, but um, i think it's always the best idea to to, to learn stuff when you do it on your own. So we will now have a next exercise on data wrangling. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so it's again, it's the same uh, way as before. So uh, we have this um, HTML file with the different exercises. This time it's a bit more. Um, you have um, half an hour to do that. Um, now I have, a, have the issue that uh, the, the break will be in 10 minutes. So I'd propose that we will, um, we can spend 40 minutes on that um, or 45 minutes. So uh, maybe let's say five, so let's meet again. I will stick around all the time, but um, let's um, talk about the um, actual solutions um, at 11. So we'll have plenty of time to conduct the actual exercises. If you have any questions in the meantime, just um, use the um, Q&A window here, or just raise your hand, and I'm gonna try to answer the questions. And other than that, have fun with the exercises. So again, uh, this is now will be combination between exercise and the break as well. Okay.
Yeah. And here's the same with the, um, yeah, this is a Linux system, Ubuntu. Um, yeah, maybe you can pr print out um, some of the um, some of the errors. Um, in my experience, um, installing, for example, the SF package on, on, on Ubuntu or Fedora or whatever you Linux system you use, is that some uh, libraries are missing, so some system libraries. So you also have to install some system libraries as well. This is sometimes really a hassle to do on Linux system. Um, but I would have to, to, to know the actual um, error message to um, track this down. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I, if I get the, the uh, questions right uh, in the Q&A window. I don't know if they, they are from, from the same person. So, um, I mean, the, the first one is it just code snippet? Um, um, I don't know if, if this produces an error message. Um, it, it should be, I guess, because um, this, this assignment operator is in the uh, wrong direction. So um, it should point to the um, uh, uh, exe3 uh, object and not to the function. So I don't know if this produces an error message. And the second one, I don't know if this is, an, um, is also a question or just a command. Um, I don't know if it's really, if it really shortens the column names, something that is often done when you use um, tibbles. So this is a data format in R that it re respects the, the screen resolution and it tries to fit everything on the screen. And sometimes it shortens the, the name just by printing, but the actual names are not shortened. So I don't know if this answers your your questions or issues. Uh, just let me know. Um, so regarding this pipe operator, there was this question. I'm uh, just um, answering it here. Um, yeah, you um, when, when this pipe operator does not work for you, uh, what you might uh, need to load first is this deployer package. I'm just going to show you my our studio screen here, and I guess I have to make it a bit bigger. Um, so this is just a toy example. So you have to load this um, deployer um, library first. And um, so here's an example how you would uh, use it again. Um, so I defined a, a vector uh, with the numbers one, two, three. And let's pretend I want to, um, to calculate a sum of this vector. So usually, uh, what you usually use in R and base R is using a sum function and then enter this vector here. Oops. And as a result, you get um, six because this is the actual sum of this number. And the pipe operator just um, is the logic that you um, don't call the function first, but you define first the object in this case, or the, the argument or the object. In this case, it's, it's vector. So you write vector, then you have your pipe operator, and then you apply the function. And this one, or the result of this call, so it's, it's the vector, gets automatically inserted as a first argument in the sum function. I mean, this is a silly and toy example, but this shows you um, the general logic again of, of um, using pipes. You don't have to use pipes. So it's just, um, can just use it um, as usual, um, first having your function name call, and, and then, um, your parentheses and, and entering uh, the object. But if you have several nested functions, it's sometimes a bit easier to, to use pipes. So I really recommend to, uh, to have a look into it uh, in the future if you, if you want to stick a bit more uh, with R, um, but you don't have to use it uh, as of now. So don't worry about it. And another general recommendation uh, with R, 
uh, sorry, it's just some, such a mess sometimes in an R with, with all the dependencies of packages. But sometimes, I don't know what, what the actual error message is that you receive, uh, Lisa, but um, sometimes it's, um, it's worthwhile to, to restart R. I don't know if you use R Studio, for example, just close the R Studio window, open it up again, and just um, with a new fresh session, just uh, try installing, for example, in this case, the, the SF package again. Um, yeah, I mean, it really depends on, on the type of, of error message, but sometimes other packages are already loaded that need the SF package, and then you can't reinstall it or update it because it, yeah, it is required, right? Yeah, easy packages uh, loads um, packages as well. Okay, and the data sets. Um, again, so you, um, I'll post the link here again into the chat window. So this is the link to the GitHub repository if you want to download the data um, or the whole repository, repository in this case. Just um, go to the GitHub page and there's this green code button up here. Just press it. And then there's the option download zip file or download zip. And there you can, it downloads the whole repository and what's also included in this repository is the data folder. And there is all the data stored. Um, so about the corona cases, but also the uh, census data about immigrants and, and inhabitants. So I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, I think we sh still sh nevertheless should um, start with um, talking about the solutions because uh, next step would be creating some uh, easy maps in R, um, which is really rewarding and, and fun to do. So after all this uh, messy data raining, this is really something that uh, is actually quite nice uh, to do and easy to do. Um, so let's open up the solutions of this exercise. So um, yeah, the first uh, um, exercise was to, or the first task was to um, um, load the, the corona cases data that you had to use the um, read sf function as on the slides. Um, and yeah, the second um, exercise was, um, I asked you to, to enter this, this huge text string into this um, st read function here and um, what this does it, it just shows you how um, flexible this function is because um, as i mentioned um, you can um, read a, a, let's say any vector data format with this function we can also um, load data directly from the internet and, and this is the address of the um, from the um, cologne's um, open data portal to this data set so um, it's similar to, to using an, an application programming interface. And when you enter this address into this function, um, you can, um, yeah, it uh, directly loads uh, the, the most recent version of this data set from the internet. And it shouldn't make a difference in comparison to what is already stored in the data folder because I used the same, the very same command last week uh, to update the data. So. Um, should make a difference, but as I said, maybe it's uh, an issue of printing. And um, yeah, I just recommended using the glue package um, to to make this um, this um, string a little bit more easier to digest uh, for your eyes. Um, yeah, the third exercise was then to transform the coordinate reference system using the st transform function. Um, yeah, again, this is. Uh, I use the pipe operator. You could also just use the st underscore transforms function, enter the name of the data set here, and use just the small digit number to transform the data set into this um, other um, coordinate reference system. 
Um, the fourth exercise was then uh, using functions from the stars package to read the um, raster files into the session um, using the read underscore stars function, so same as on the slides again. And the fifth exercise was then to, to aggregate um, the number of immigrants in each district uh, using the sum function. And this should produce an error message. So uh, this was really uh, a bit mean for, <laughs> from me uh, because um, yeah, we have the issue of um, non-matching coordinate reference systems. So this is um, uh, refers to this beam I've shown you in the introductory uh, slides um, that the layers, uh, layers must match. And sometimes they doesn't, but, but sometimes you think they, they, they match because we already transformed the data, but sometimes uh, there's something messed up. And this is also an issue with this um, current transition from the different um, systems of define um, coordinate reference systems in R. And um, if you compare um, both um, CRS strings, um, at first sight, it doesn't um, look different, but uh, especially down here, there's a big difference between the CRS. And this is why um, R can't um, create this um, aggregation um, with these um, CRS. And the solution is to um, retransform uh, the raster data again to this um, um, 3035 CRS um, system. And there are several ways you could use. So um, um, you could use the function from the SF package as well, but um, there's also in the stars package uh, function that you could use for transforming the data. Um, this is done here. And yeah, in a um, second last step, um, you then uh, had the opportunity to uh, re-enter um, the, this procedure into your console, and then this count variable should be created without any error messages. Um, yeah, and as the last exercise was then to create an image grant share variable again. Um, this is something you could have done uh, before uh, based on the raster data. In this case, we created the counts before, and uh, then from this counts, we created this image grant share variable. And if you plot this uh, result, um, yeah, you get a nice map with um, the immigrant shares in Cologne. All right, any questions on that? so far because speaking of maps uh, we are now coming to creating our first maps and we have a short introduction to to um, building your map in r it's called easy map so because uh, we will use a package that just makes it fairly easy to use uh, to create maps in r um, just have to uh, rearrange all my windows So we are here now, okay, last uh, third of, of this um, workshop. So um, I hope, um, I mean, data wrangling, I, I mean, data wrangling is fun for me. I don't know about you because that's really um, maybe a character trait uh, by myself, but uh, what at least should be fun for all of us is um, creating uh, uh, maps. So, um, because um, you always get, um, some, some visuals and visuals are nice for, for us humans and especially when we work with data. And um, there are, um, or what, what we have already seen is that it's fairly easy using this generic plot command in R to create uh, one of your first, first maps. So you could use, for example, for this Corona, Cologne, uh, Cologne Corona data, you could use the plot command to have um, this incidence number, for example. Um, um, but it's not really flexible this function. So we will use now other functions to manip manipulate some of these features of the map. And there are some general rules we should follow when we create maps. Um, what maps should um, um, provide is, is yeah, reduction to the most important inform information. So it should not be um, overblown with, with information. Um, it should also, but it should comprise something like legends, scales, um, and also descriptions of the features. And it should be um, orientated at the audience. Um, and in best cases, um, this is not part of the, of, the, of the now following slides, but we'll have this later on. It should also adjust for color vision deficiencies. Uh, this is also nowadays a very important feature. 
So um, instead of good maps, or in contrast to good maps, bad maps um, are overcrowded and, and have overlapping features, for example, unreadable information. That's often something you have to deal with. And um, yeah, things like legends or, or even sources are missing and, and the color palettes are simply not well suited, for example. And um, you can spend whole days on creating such maps. Um, but what we often in our work like to propose is the creation of a fast, fast but still a nice map. So it facilitates the fast exploration of spatial data. So by visualization, just of the geometries and the attributes. And it might not be publication ready yet. So as I said, you can spend days for that. But um, yeah, it's still at least rewarding for you and also for, for the audience uh, to have a fast look at the data. And there are several choices in R uh, for creating maps. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, you could also create maps in, in base R uh, using the map data package. You can create interactive maps using the leaflet package. Um, what we will use um, is the tmap package, but there are also obviously some other alternatives as usual in, in R, there's always at least two packages for the same procedure. Uh, for example, for interactive maps, you could also use the map view package if you want to, but we will stick to the tmap package um, for this um, section here. Um, what is nice about the tmap package, um, it's rather intuitive. Um, because it also makes good decisions for you. So you don't have to manipulate everything at once. And if you're familiar with, with plotting in R and especially using um, a modern ggplot2 package, um, it's very, the syntax is really similar to ggplot. And um, yeah, this is because it's also based on ggplot. So you could use ggplot also to create a maps. Um, so you don't have to use tmap, uh, but tmap is something like a wrapper around G, uh, ggplot to create maps. So to create um, our first map in Tmap, um, what you usually need is uh, the de definition of the data set. Uh, for this purpose, you use the um, TM shape uh, function and where you define um, the data set. And you use the plus operator to, um, to add um, an actual geometry or uh, um, yeah, the, the um, representation of a geometry. In this case, we use uh, the TM underscore fill and this creates, and we uh, then um, define also the, the variable. This is the incidence number. So to recreate our first map with a plot function, we use this command and it creates this uh, data set, which it looks, at least in my opinion, a bit nicer than, than just uh, the output from the simple plot function. So in a nutshell, uh, what you usually use is you define your spatial object using the TM shape function. And um, then we have these um, building blocks that determine how this information is displayed or how information from this data set is displayed. Um, so yeah, first the team shape, and then you can use several different ways to display. What we have seen is um, the team fill function. This would produce um, polygons without borders. You could also use um, team polygons, polygons with borders and so forth. We'll see an example in a minute. And um, for all other geometries or shapes, um, you can use similar functions. Uh, too many to, to, to display them all here at once, but you can uh, inspect them using um, the internal help functions in R using the um, question mark and then the uh, tmap um, dash element uh, uh, here as written here. So again, um, to, to have uh, polygons, you could use the, the team fill uh, function produces a polygon without any boundaries. If you want to have boundaries, you just use uh, TM polygons. And this would create um, polygons with boundaries. So it makes sense in this case because it's uh, districts data and don't, don't want to only see the, the actual boundaries around it. Um, but you could also uh, use the TM borders function to just have the borders. Uh, yeah, and similar if you, um, have, for example, lines data. Um, one example in the data folder is the um, streets of Cologne data set. Um, you could use then the lines command. Um, so tm underscore lines would produce some uh, the road network of Cologne, or at least from, from the main road uh, in Cologne. And uh, yeah, in a similar vein, uh, if you 
um, have uh, points data as our hospitals cologne, you can use the tm underscore dots function to create some uh, points data. Yeah. So um, the nice thing now is that uh, you can combine them. So not only display one feature at the same time or one data set at the one, sometimes you can um, layer them on top of each, of each other. So for example, in this case, we use um, our Corona cases in Cologne uh, data set. We um, define uh, polygons, so um, polygons with, with boundaries. Uh, we then add the um, streets network data with the team shape function here, add them as lines. And then we add the uh, hospitals and add them with dots. And what we also do with the hospitals that we, uh, we um, yeah, make them a little bit more colorful using uh, the call argument here and then define a color. And this is the result of it. So this is fairly easy to get started with uh, several data sources and map them uh, really easy and really fast. Um, there's much more you could definitely do um, uh, when, when uh, using TMAP. Um, so uh, what we've already seen is that you can define a variable of interest uh, by the, the, yeah, stating the column name. Um, you can also add legends, color palettes, and adjust legends and, and scales, as we will see in a minute. So, uh, for example, again, if we want to have um, an attribute um, mapped, uh, for example, our incidences um, of corona cases, uh, we just define uh, this variable name here uh, as a first argument, and it will re receive a map with um, the incidences. Um, we can then use arguments to, to manipulate the colors. So for example, you can use an other color palette ranging, for example, from uh, red to purple. Um, and we can also then um, have another title uh, for the legend that is automatically created. And we can also define the style, so a different style. So this is something I'd like to invite you just to, to figure out um, referring to the, to the help pages because um, yeah, it's too much uh, to show them all. And it's, I think, more rewarding to, the, to do this um, on your own. Um, so, but this is the result uh, from this um, um, effort. And yeah, I mean, um, as I said, you can, can manipulate also the legends. We already did that with the title, but you could also use options to place this um, uh, legend outside of the, of the map um, using the tm underscore layout function. And there's the option legend dot outside when you, um, it's a logical variable. So um, if you define it as true, um, oh, sorry, the, um, legend is uh, placed outside. So there's a lot left. And as I said, you can spend days on it, uh, but something you should always consider to do is add um, compasses and scale bars. And this is something that can be done with the um, tm scale bar command here and the tm compass command. So it's all stacked together as an, another building block. Um, you can also change the, the appearance of, of these um, scale bars and compasses. So for example, if you want to have the scale bar on the left side, not on the right, you can you have a position argument here. If you want to have another type or uh, yeah, yeah, another um, compass, uh, there are other options to do that. For example, here's this four star function and so forth. So it's also yeah, a matter of taste, I guess. And, and I don't want to uh, predefine what, what, you, <laughs> what your map should look like. So just be aware that there are options and it's also a good idea to refer uh, to the help pages. Um, what is also quite nice uh, from this TMAP tools package uh, that I'll ask you to install is that you can um, extract data from OpenStreetMap on the fly um, using um, your data set as input. So what we do here is we use this read underscore as amp function, enter, um, our data set, so a Corona Cologne data set, and then it extracts um, data from OpenStreetMap on the fly, just for this um, cutout map of Cologne. And you can enter this information also in TMAP and this TM shape function. So this is the data set that you entered there. And you must know that this data set is now not a vector data set anymore. It's actually a raster, raster data set with different color bands. So RGB, and this creates a colored map. So the output of this um, effort, uh, again, is um, if you use the tm underscore RGB function here, is and then enter, for example, um, your corona, corona, uh, corona, corona data set again, um, that you have something like a background map created. 
uh, with this part here. So this is the background here. It's just a picture comprising different color bands uh, defined uh, by these RGB colors. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice and a fast way to create actually a map that looks like a map that you would see somewhere else published as well. And um, yeah, again, there are several options you could use. You could um, uh, yeah, use different types of background maps. So there's uh, the type command in this uh, read underscore OSM package. Um, for example, this is the option for the uh, from from Esri. That's a commercial um, data comp, uh, geospatial data company, also providing some some um, OpenStreetMap type data. Um, when you apply this uh, option here, it looks a bit different in comparison to to before. That's again, I think, a matter of taste <laughs> what you prefer. Um, there's um, as you can see up here. Uh, there's also um, Again, a way to, to find out what types are actually available in R. So don't, don't worry, you don't have to know them by heart. So another example, for example, is the stamen watercolor, uh, what I, which is a type I like, maybe not too scientific, but it's uh, also nice to, to get some nice visuals regarding maps. Yeah, and that's pretty much it to get started uh, creating your first maps in R. As I said, um, you should, um, be creative and, and uh, use different functions uh, or different options and uh, uh, see what what uh, is more uh, as your of, of, of your taste <laughs> actually um, but we need some one last note on on mapping and this is the uh, mapping yeah what we call note um, um, what we call mapping responsible so um, because um, maps also provide opportunities or, or the risk of, of, of exploiting the information. So, um, I mean, in the best case, really maps are just um, easy to understand um, and um, they transport um, scientific messages in an excellent way, um, reproducible and transparent way. But sometimes they can also display spurious correlations uh, or draw even dramatic pictures of the world. Um, and, Therefore, they shape narratives as well. I mean, we all know this by now, I guess, uh, looking at um, incidence rates in different countries and uh, for, for, for Corona. And um, yeah, so uh, be aware that this is a huge topic and that it's also uh, a huge responsibility when you create maps, maps for um, publications. And, and even the choice of uh, coordinate reference systems can make a difference, as we've seen in this true size uh, application on the web. Um, so yeah, colors also have a strong influence, for example. So if I, I don't know, um, if I map immigrant chairs and I use um, a color palette ranging from I don't know, yellow to red, and the more red it is, the more immigrants live there. Red is sometimes a warning color, but is this really something we should be warned or alarmed about uh, if there are a lot of immigrants living in a certain district of the city? So um, be aware of that. And, and there's also the issue I just I mentioned in the beginning of, of color vision deficiencies. So um, there are people that um, have struggles um, seeing specific colors, not only on maps, but in general. And um, here's an example of, um, of this standard palette that we have used for our um, um, first uh, T-map. And um, up here uh, is, um, are the colors with um, normal uh, vision. So it's as it appeared, of, at least for, for, for most of us, I guess. And, um, and here are um, the appearances for, for different types of color vision deficiencies. And um, it might happen that um, distinctions between colors cannot be seen from, from uh, people um, on different maps. And, and there are specialized color palettes that you could use, for example, the Viridis palette that makes uh, these distinctions between colors a, a bit more easy. And um, here again, uh, this is the, uh, the, the map with the normal division up here uh, on the top left. And uh, this is how it appears for, for other um, color vision deficiencies. Um, yeah. So um, I, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it might be a bit odd to, to use this Viridis palette, for, for example. So this is something uh, you have to get used to it because you don't see it that often. Um, not yet, at least, um, but 
at least in my publication, I'm more and more trying um, to include these color palettes uh, in the actual publication because it's, um, yeah, it's better for, for all of us uh, if all people can understand what you're actually producing uh, in your research output. Um, yeah, and if you're interested in maps, uh, there are obviously, obviously even more resources. I mean, you could also spend a whole day or two or three days on, on creating maps, even in such a course as this one. Um, but um, yeah, if you're um, interested in, yeah, dive deeper into uh, TMAP, especially there's this introduction um, uh, or this blog post uh, that are linked here. And uh, what's also nice, it just um, is still going on, I think there's this uh, on Twitter, this 30 day map challenge uh, where people get uh, the same exercise each day to create a map, map in R, uh, not only in R, but most people use R nowadays. Um, and um, there's also a link for to the uh, last year's repository because it's always then that nice to see what people actually do in R uh, for create maps. Uh, but now we will um, turn to um, creating our own maps in R using the T map package. So this is the third and last exercise of this workshop. Um, again, uh, just click on this link here or use the navigation uh, features from uh, the GitHub repository directly. And um, yeah, um, just have fun with it. Uh, you don't have to stick to the exact um, um, exercise. You can try stuff on your own. I'd suggest that um, you maybe will meet again in about 20 minutes, so quarter to 12. So then we have a couple of minutes left to discuss the solutions of the exercise. And then we also have our uh, wrap up closing Q and A session. Some several slides prepared, but it's not that important that you actually see them today. If you don't want to, if you have more questions, we can uh, more talk about this question because this is the whole purpose of this workshop that we have this uh, more or less direct contact uh, and talk about um, uh, interactively about um, issues you might have or questions you might have. All right, have fun. All right. Um, there are only 50 minutes left in this workshop already. Um, I'd suggest that we proceed with the solutions. Um, but as I said earlier, I mean, this, this workshop is a service on its own. Um, my personal service uh, would be um, if you have any questions after the workshop, any struggles or need more information, more resources, just approach me uh, via email and I'm trying to answer uh, them. Um, I, I mean, I will answer, but I'm trying to answer them content-wise. Um, I mean, this is the issue with such short courses that we cannot spend too much time on, on, on individual error messages, which is really a pity. Um, but yeah, and, and especially something that is a struggle uh, with these online courses as well, because I can't watch or look at your um, computer screen um, as well. Uh, but we still have these 50 minutes. Um, I have my closing slides and we can also then um, talk about um, uh, or maybe um, talk about more stuff. Um, I will also stick a couple of minutes longer here if you have any more questions on uh, other topics as well. So don't worry about this. Okay, so solutions for creating maps. Um, so um, yeah, what I asked you up front uh, before uh, working on the, the exercises was to um, use this TMAP options here. Um, this um, option makes sure that when there are invalid geometries in your data set that, it, that they get fixed automatically. If you set this variable to false, it will produce an error message, otherwise just a warning message. So this is uh, also a question, question that occurred on issue that occurred that uh, was still this issue, uh, this warning message. But um, yeah, it's just a warning message. Um, yeah. And yeah, so, so the first um, exercise more or less was to, to again load the um, Corona Cologne data set again, and then um, create a map with the outline only. And for this purpose, um, I mean, you first need uh, to use the st read function again, and then you use this tm fill um, building block here in, in the tmap um, function to um, to um, yeah specify uh, the the outside uh, the the outer boundaries of of the city. And um, yeah, another task was to define a color. Um, I used the light gray color, but you could also use red, blue, or whatever you want um, to um, have a colorful map. 
Um, then the second uh, exercise or task was to um, create a map where the district's borders are visible. And you can also use, or if you wanted to, you we were also um, invited to use colors uh, for that. So for this purpose, you need these TM polygon uh, function from TMAP package. And I've chosen light blue colors. But again, uh, be creative. Um, so alternative would be, for example, pink colors. Uh, OK, and uh, then we uh, next task was then to, to visualize some, some information about the COVID-19 cases in, in Cologne. Um, and I ask you to use this A underscore seven underscore 100 uh, variable. So the cases in the last seven days per 100,000 inhabitants. And um, this is fairly easy to do in TMAP. So you use your the function as before, for example, the TM polygon um, function, and then you specify the variable name with a string here. And then you get this nice map with the um, actual cases for each district um, and, the, and the corresponding legend. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, fourth exercise then was to referring uh, this, to this whole issue of uh, color vision deficiencies. Um, where I asked you to use this Veritas color palette, and this is also fairly easy to do with the palette uh, argument in TMAP. So the same command as before, just this new uh, argument, uh, palette Veritas, and then receive this map. There are other um, color palettes for color vision deficiencies. Uh, one is, for example, the magma. Um, color palette, it's shown here. Again, matter of taste, uh, what, what kind you, do you prefer? Or the plasma palette as well. So this is another one. And the inferno uh, color palette, which is shown here. And sometimes it makes sense to, to, to um, have them uh, arranged in one row to, to, to see the actual differences and to, to choose between them. And yeah, the, the fifth exercise was then to um, um, add a legend title and to place the legend outside of the title. To um, define a title, you need the um, title command within the, um, for example, TM polygon uh, function as shown here. So we have now a title called COVID-19 cases per, uh, uh, yeah, per 100,000 inhabitants in the last seven days. This, this last is a bit it's too much. And uh, you use uh, would you have to use the tm underscore layout function to place the legend outside using this option here, and you can also place it on the left side if you want to. Yeah. So there's also the question right now in the in the uh, Q and A window um, if it overlaps the map, is there a way to fix it? And placing the legend outside would be one way to fix it. Um, yeah. And then there was the exercise to, to add a compass and the scale bar to the map, and also ask you to, to place in a different, um, different uh, places. And this is something you will also find out using just the, um, the help function in R as well. So um, for the, the scale bar, for example, you have also this position argument and um, can define a vector to, to define a position um, either left or right and also top or bottom as well. This is shown here. So this is the corresponding map of this exercise. OK, and then um, lastly, uh, I ask you to, to also import the hospital's Cologne data set and place, place them as um, points on the map. And this is an exercise of adding several layers uh, in the TMAP map. So um, we, again, use the stread function to read the data set or to import the data set. Uh, we then define the map as before. And the only difference is that we, again, define um, a new data set of these hospitals Cologne data set, in this case, with the team and shape function, and add them with dots. And I also made them red um, to have them placed on this map here. That's pretty much it. OK. Um, any questions on that? Other than that, I'm just going to open my, my final slides, um, just the appetizer for the Q&A, if you will. Um, and then we. Hopefully, have some time also to, to answer some questions if there are any remaining questions. And as I said, I, I'm going to stick here for a couple uh, of more minutes, um, but you're <laughs> obviously uh, free to, to leave uh, at any time. Um,
waiting every, until everything's opened. Okay, so we are in the last session. And um, I mean, I don't know if it's good style to, 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 to start with, with what is actually missing. Uh, but what we have learned so far is, uh, I mean, um, importing data, which is quite important. We know what geospatial data um, is out there, what kind of formats uh, or types uh, are out there, um, how you can process them, how you can import them in the first place, and, and also applying some more spatial linking or applying some spatial linking methods and, and also visualizing the data. But there's obviously um, some more also regarding um, these spatial linking methods regarding the actual analysis of geospatial data and also the applications. So far, we have only have seen this toy example of the uh, corona cases in Cologne. So with regards um, to the spatial linking methods, for example, um, here are some examples from my own research. Um, we have used uh, georeference survey data. So I'm still a survey researchers, researcher. And um, these data usually come as, as points data. So you have points of, of respondents' locations uh, in a survey. And here I added them um, to, um, to yeah, added road traffic noise data to, to the survey data. And I mean, the, the most simple case, and this is something we have more or less also done, is to add um, the decibels value from the road traffic noise one by one, just by the location. But you could also, for example, um, calculate distances um, of the points to the next um, noise source of a specific decibel uh, value, for example. There are more complicated procedures as well. For example, so-called filter methods where you can relate, um, uh, in this case, boundering, um, boundering um, grid values from a raster data set to one of the direct raster data set. This is something that's all, also often done. And um, the fourth example here uh, is, is something I've explained to you um, earlier is, is the use of these buffer methods or these circular areas around, um, in this case, uh, respondents' locations to calculate mean values of, um, in this case, uh, land use um, uh, around their um, address. So this is with regards to um, spatial linking or spatial overlays. There's definitely more, <laughs> obviously, as this method is so flexible. Um, with regards to the analysis, um, I just mentioned that um, often geospatial data are clustered, there's spatial dependence, and there are different ways of modeling the spatial dependence. You could do this uh, also via distances, so that you calculate distances between um, geographic units. Uh, you could also do this via, um, via boundering units, for example. This is just one way to model the spatial dependence, and then you can um, see if there is any spatial dependence. So if, if, if these units share common features, if they are neighboring each other, and there's corresponding um, yeah, regression models also to, to model such spatial dependencies and diffusion processes. So this is also something for a whole week course. Uh, I once visited a, while, a whole week on, on such methods, uh, but you could definitely spend half a year on this topic as well because it's really, um, these are really complicated econometric uh, regression models. Um, but um, just using this, the spatial linking methods you've seen before, for example, for this, um, for georeference survey data, here's one example or one application for, from my own research, just, just an appetizer, not to brag, just to show you that it's worthwhile to get to invest some of your time into uh, using GIS. Um, it's from here. So uh, in this case, I um, linked the uh, address uh, coordinates of survey respondents from the German General Social Survey to information about um, soil sealing. So this is the water and airtight coverage of um, soils. Um, and this is a land use disadvantage uh, for, for people. Um, and uh, what I um, inspected is uh, the distribution of these land use disadvantages across different income groups and different um, migration groups. Um, so in this case, we, we see that um, that migrants, at least in Germany, are more often affected uh, by land use disadvantages. I'm sorry, this is the um, example of green spaces. So this is a um, land use advantage. So migrants in the low income ranges tend to be um, 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 less surrounded by green spaces. So they suffer from missing green spaces and, and Germans are not. Um, and with 
increasing income, uh, they can compensate a bit uh, for this missing green spaces, but not as much as Germans. So this is just uh, a small example of how you could uh, use um, GIS methods together also with survey research. All right, so um, yeah, I'm more or less on time. Um, it's pretty much it. Uh, now it's time to, to ask some questions. Um, um, at this point, I'd like to, to thank you for, for your attention. It was fun, uh, even though those, those virtual events, I think um, a lot of people are nowadays a bit tired of, of these events and might be a bit nicer to do this in person in the future, but it's also, I think, a nice uh, way of um, yeah, learning something with, with less, with only minor investment uh, in just three hours only, uh, not without. So you don't have to travel uh, for a Cologne uh, for this uh, effort as well. So that's maybe something that's nice. Um, but yeah, I had fun. Uh, I hope you too. And um, yeah, please ask any questions or any feedback if you have something.